I feel we are on a knife's edge. I feel that we're in the midst of a major kind of global reset, economic reset, geopolitical reset. Rana Faruhar reports on business and technology for the Financial Times. Today, we look at what the exponential growth of big tech firms recently might mean for the global economy. I could also imagine that we could have a battle between the Washington consensus, the Beijing consensus, and the Facebook consensus. Welcome to this podcast produced by the International Monetary Fund. I'm Bruce Edwards. Rana Faruhar is the global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times. She was invited by the Institute for Capacity Development to talk about her latest book titled Don't Be Evil that examines the implications for society of the growing influence of Silicon Valley tech giants in all aspects of the economy. So um, I thought it was interesting to read that that you were actually working in the tech industry when the bubble burst in 2000. How did that experience influence you in terms of um, what you choose to write about? Mm, that's a great question. Um, yeah, for my for my sins, I left journalism briefly and worked in a venture capital firm in London. Um, it was funded by Citigroup and a couple of other big investors, and our mission was to find. Uh, if you can remember these acronyms, B to C, meaning business to consumer, uh, digital plays across Europe. And the whole thing was predicated on a couple of uh, things which we've realized don't work as seamlessly as we had thought, one being the European Union um, and the other being, you know, startups in the Internet space. Um, you know, one of the things I found is that we were trying to create things from scratch and in a lot of the categories, you know, be it a travel company across Europe or a European MP3 giant or, you know, some other sort of consumer play, that Silicon Valley was already on it. They already owned that space. And the platform space really is a winner take all space. Um, you know, if you read uh, the, the chief economist of Google is a guy named Hal Varian and he mm -hmm. wrote a book uh, in the 1990s along with Carl Shapiro called Information Rules. And it's really a primer for thinking about how platforms work and why they are natural monopolies. And um, yeah, I kind of wish I would have read it before I joined that VC firm. <laughs> <laughs> so you do write about, uh, you know, the inequities of, of big tech now, mostly. And, and your talk today at the IMF was about how data is, is now making wealthy corporations uh, wealthier by the minute. Uh, the data thing did happen very quickly. What was it that triggered the, this idea of uh, monetizing data? Uh, it's a great question. So my book, my second book, Don't Be Evil, goes back and traces a little bit of this history. Uh, the consumer internet basically was born in the 1990s. And you go back to the founding of Google, you know, the first search engine that really helped to launch a lot of the apps and the, the services that we now enjoy. And that was the brainchild of Larry Page and Sergey Brin when they were at uh, Stanford. And if you look at the initial paper that they did as part of their thesis project, it sort of lays out how to think about search, how to think about um, creating a search engine, but then how you would monetize it. And one of the things that's fascinating is that the two pointed out what we now know in the wake of Donald Trump and Brexit, which is that these platforms uh, can be used to do very targeted advertising to individuals. They can um, track people. They can they can monitor your behaviors, and those can then be targeted by advertisers. And that was one of the reasons why the pair said in the beginning, you know, we think it wouldn't be a great idea to monetize this kind of search engine with tar targeted advertising because the interests of the users and the people, be they public entities or companies that were trying to advertise, might not be in alignment, um, which is kind of amazing. You have to read all the way down to the appendix to get there, but it's worth it. Mm. And then, uh, you know, then the venture capitalists get involved. You now they tried subscription at first, and then it was pretty quickly after that that they realized, no, you know what? Targeted advertising is where the money is. We're going to do that. 
So, uh, you know, in your book, actually published before the pandemic started, you you suggest uh, that big tech had already become too big to fail uh, because the sector was so critical to the economy and uh, because of the huge amounts of cash reserves that these firms uh, have accumulated. Um, and today in your talk, you mentioned how even banks now are, are worried uh, about how big these tech giants have become. How does this fit into the uh, broader economic system, you know, th these cash reserves that they hold? Well, I'll start by saying that um, over the last decade or so, there has been a huge wealth transfer from Wall Street to Silicon Valley, um, so that you now have a situation where about 80% of corporate wealth is living in 10% of companies that are the richest in data, software, intellectual property, um, and other kinds of IP. And so that's basically the platform players and the Qualcomm's, the Cisco's, the Intel's. Um, so this is where wealth lives in intangibles. Well, who has the most intangibles? Big tech does, particularly in the form of data. Um, they have transformed any number of industries, not just consumer retail or search or apps and services. They're transfer, they're, they're transforming finance. Um, you know, Jamie Dimon, who's the head of uh, JP Morgan, uh, was saying that his whole business is in danger of being, um, you know, going under because platforms are taking over. They, there's asymmetric rules there. They're, they're not bound by the same kind of regulation that a bank would be or that a healthcare provider would be or that an educator would be. I mean, they're in all of these areas. And there's incredible opacity in the business model, which, of course, always works in favor of entrenched players and monopoly power. Yeah, and do you think that the the pandemic has pushed that even further? Well, for sure, because of course, as I say, that they've moved into areas like healthcare, like human resources, like education. You know, I have a, I had a child last year in the New York City public schools, and you can't be online in school in New York unless you are on Google. You know, it's just they mm -hmm. they own the platform. the 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 data is being collected by them, um, and there's just an incredible amount of capture. Mm. Uh, would you characterize it as uh, essentially an unregulated utility at this point? Uh, you know, they, they can essentially choose to service whatever neighborhoods or communities that, that they want. Yeah, no, that that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I think that they are a utility in the sense that broadband and access to the internet is it's like it's like water, it's like gas. It's something that you have to have to be part of the 21st century economy. Um, I could very easily imagine a way in which Google could be run like a utility and managed and, and regulated like an, a utility. I could also imagine a scenario in which something like Amazon, which is both a platform and a player on its own platform, could just be broken up and you, you wouldn't have the paradigm that you are both making a market and trading in that market. And there are rules, for example, in the financial sector against that. And I'm very much for all... Uh, existing rules being taken into the digital space so there's not this asymmetry. Uh, and so one of your recent uh, Financial Times columns is about what you call a texodus, where big tech firms and, and high net worth people are moving south to cities like Miami. Uh, is this trend driven, do you think, by uh, remote work requirements imposed by the pandemic? And do you think that it will have a lasting effect on on the post-pandemic economy. And, you know, in terms of big tech's influence on what cities and communities uh, look like. Well, big tech is moving to Miami because they're being given incredible incentives and tax breaks. Uh, but most research, and there's been great research on this by the Upjohn Institute, shows that major tax incentives do not end up um, creating more prosperity for workers. They create tax breaks for big companies and private equity titans and investors. And so I think that that's what's happening in Miami. I think this is basically just the new uh, the new Switzerland by the sea or Cayman Islands by the sea, whatever you want to call it. New York is raising taxes and the mayor of Miami is saying, come here and we'll give you incentives. Um, so that's that's one thing. But I do think that this idea of Zoom towns is something real and productive. And I'm very pleased to see broadband in the Biden infrastructure plan because that's going to be crucial to creating the possibility of people using work from home to move into areas where real estate is not as expensive, where there might be more options for flexibility, for family care. You know, that I think is a real positive, And we're just at the beginning of that. Hmm. 
Uh, so just to close here, as a reporter who, who reports on economic trends, on how those trends affect people, um, are you encouraged by, by what you're seeing out there? I, I mean, are you more perhaps um, optimistic than, than your average IMF economist, say? That's a really good question. I think one of the most interesting things to me right now is I feel we're on a knife's edge. I feel that we're in the midst of a major kind of global reset, economic reset, geopolitical reset. Um, we're leaving the neoliberal era. We're moving into the post neoliberal era. There are ways in which more regionalization and more remooring of wealth in place could be a great thing and could dampen populism and some of the things that have put us in a bad spot in the last few years. I can also imagine that we could have a great power conflict and a square off between the Washington consensus, the Beijing consensus and the Facebook consensus. Rana Faruhar, global business columnist and associate editor at the Financial Times. Thanks so much for this. Thank you. Look for Rana Faruhar's latest book, Don't Be Evil, at ranafaruhar.com. You can also read more about building a better data economy in the March issue of Finance and Development magazine. Read it online at imf.org slash fnd. And look for other IMF podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at IMF underscore podcast. Thanks for listening.